on your Jump, 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 jump. What we don't start it. Look at what we don't start it. This the people party. What's up, party people in the place to be? My name is Talib Kwali. I'm your host for People's Party. Give it up to my lovely co-host, Jasmine Lee. Woo! <laughs> that was a pretty loud woo, Jasmine. That wasn't me this time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really enjoying doing this show. Um, and thank you to everybody who's tuning in and supporting us every week. I really enjoy doing it because it gives me the opportunity to meet and speak to and engage with and powwow with people that I grew up being inspired by mm -hmm. very often. You understand what I'm saying? A lot of people on the show I never imagined even ever meeting, mm -hmm. let alone sitting down for an extended period of time and having a conversation. And um, this next gentleman, this next guest is someone who I'm very excited to sit down and have a conversation with about hip hop, about movies, about the state of the culture, this gentleman is an icon. Mm -hmm. He's an institution. The group Compton's Most Wanted, one of the most important rap groups of all time. As a solo artist, he's incredible. He's in one of the most fantastic movies ever made about black life, Menace to Society. The voice of Ryder on Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Ladies and gentlemen, the People's Party is proud to present and welcome MC8 in the house. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What's up, H? Yeah, how you feeling? Thank you for coming, bro. All day, man. All day. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Yes, how you sir. feeling? I'm feeling good, man. Just oh, relaxed, man. chilling. You know, no doubt. Doing what we do. No doubt. You feel the uh, party vibe up in here? Yeah, man. I, I love the love. Man. Okay. Yes, no indeed. Doubt. Yes, indeed. We got love for um, anybody who represents the culture like you. We shout out to Brady Watt. Brady, my boy Brady. Yep. Shout out to Brady on the bass guitar. You know, yep. that's my people, Stu DJ Premier. You know, long time, long time family right there. No you doubt. know what I'm saying? No doubt. Brady is, uh, he also plays bass in my band. And um, he's very good. And uh, you did Bass and Bars, which is a show he has. Right. Which he has rappers rapping over him playing a bass. Yes, indeed. Um, and he connected me with you. Yeah, I, I I was I was surprised. I mean, mm -hmm. you've been a you you've been a, a staple. Okay. In hip hop, you know okay. what I'm saying. Even for us West Coast, you know what I'm no saying. No doubt. Those those, uh, those projects was real hitting home to us. You oh, know what thank I'm saying? you, brother. So it, it's an honor to be able to sit down with somebody you know who who embraces hip hop. You know what I'm no saying? No doubt. Real talk. Um, you have we. I want to get into your relationship with Premier later, <laughs> um, because it's it's a special topic Righteous. I want to address. Um, but, you know, we have Jared Meyer here. He started Ruckus Records when I was on Ruckus back in the day. Okay. You know? I don't know if he deserved a whole round of applause. I'm sorry I started that. I started it. <laughs> but, but, um, what's interesting, one of the strategies, and Jared, you can correct me if I'm wrong, of, of Ruckus, is we were very East Coast-centric artists, but I feel like Radio wise, we popped off in the West and in LA really first. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's real accurate. Yeah, it's like Friday Night Flavors. Mr. Chalk, J-Rock, and Beat yeah. Junkies on the radio. Um, I mean, even before then, I mean, back to my youth, when I was listening to Static uh, 1580K, they, mm -hmm. they played uh, Treacherous 3. Yeah. Uh, Kumo D, Eric B and Rakim, mm -hmm. you know, so... It, it was kind of a, a East Coast rap was something we were, was something I was bred upon, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, so... You were cited as someone who has bi-coastal appeal, mm -hmm. but very early... Right. Um, I feel like it has a lot to do with the musical choices you was making when y'all was making them early CMW records. Yeah. Um, back when I first started, you know, not to discredit West Coast, you know, artists and the musical styles, but, you know, we all grew up on the Parliaments, the George Clintons, the whatever. So mm -hmm. a lot of that was bred upon that because that was our neighborhood music. Yeah. You know, uh, Roger Troutman, Zap. So... But dealing with a guy, uh, Terry Allen, known as uh, DJ Slip, mm -hmm. he was just one of those innovative producers to where he did not want to use typical West Coast sounds. And then myself, I, I like the jazz music. Yeah. I listen to... I listen to sound wave type of music, just musical stuff. So yeah. I wanted to get away from just the normal funky worm mm -hmm. parliament, George Clinton sound. So we would rap off of 
Craig T. Cooper. Mm -hmm. We would sample uh, the meters, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that, because, you know, we wanted to be different, even though we still wanted to speak about the neighborhood griefs and poverty stricken and trying to struggle and mm -hmm. youths growing up in the neighborhood. I wanted to have musical shit. I've heard you like can function a lot. Exactly. I like can well, function a lot. Yeah, myself. definitely. It's not... Just the music, though, that's a big part of it is also, I think, your voice and the way you approach it. You have a, a style that's very unique in how you rap, whereas you pause for effect. Yes. It's like you get to the end of the bar, and then you like, it's like this anticipation, and then you say the, the, the word. Exactly. Where'd you get that style from? I just, I guess you can say one to have that impact. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't want my songs to just be the typical throwaway of hip hop music because it felt good and we were just trying to be braggadocious or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, as people would say, you know, storytelling is what I do. So mm -hmm. basically I wanted to give you graphic visions and I wanted to depict of what, you know, what I was trying to show you as far as just in the song. Mm -hmm. So you could sit back, close your eyes and listen and kind of visualize what was going on, not having to see a video or probably never even even see an MC8 or whatever, mm. but you could basically feel what I was trying to bring you by being, you know, that, 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 uh, I want to say that just outspoken as far as trying to get people to visualize what my words were trying to be, you mm. know what I'm saying? So I would always give you that effect of, you know, let me take you through this story and then the build up and then at the end, here's the climax. Right. Compton informed a lot of those choices in your music, obviously, you being from Compton. How did Compton become such a creative incubator for hip-hop? So much talent come from the city. And just for years, there's a maintained level of talent, starting from Compton's Most Wanted to Kendrick Lamar. We've always been a bread for, you know, talent. I mean, if you can look at music, sports, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, I think because of, as a youth we were looking for that alternative, you know what I'm saying? So to be as far as a way out, mm -hmm. you know, so we put that extra effort or the graphics or whatever it had to be as far as thinking that we can make it out of the situation. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's, that's where we came up with trying to establish that foundation for Cats Longer because of what we went through as far as, like I said, having to grow up so young mm. and being able to depict and see what was going on as far as youth was concerned. So basically, we just, you know, it was just the description of being where we was from that mm. led us to trying to build the foundation. And now you can see people build off of it from the beginning, beginning from back in the days, you know, because I got my craft from listening to cats like Toddy T mm. and Mixmaster Spade, who basically rapped over, you know, TDK tapes. Mm. And then basically they just depicted what was going on in Compton, L.A. about the, you know, police brutality and brothers mm -hmm. trying to slang and gang bang mm -hmm. and all that. So I think going through that gave us a little edge of trying to be, you know, the, the hidden gems, so to speak, of what was in Compton. It's so crazy because we were talking about accents yesterday and like you literally sound like what you think of when you think of L.A. Like you just mm. have that whole vibe. The typical uh, that L.A. slang. Talk. Yeah. yeah. Um, you grew up. Uh, well, you were in actual gang banging like you, yes. you said you didn't feel like you had another choice. Um, <clears throat> did you get into that through family or through street ties? I mean, I was a. Uh... I, I guess I say as, as a youth, I had the same typical dreams of any other kid. Oh, I'm going to be a policeman. I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to be a doctor, lawyer. But as you start growing up and you start seeing what was really around you, and like I said, I was in a home with a single mother, you know, older sister. You know, my older sister gravitated to the gang members. Mm. So, you know, when they're coming around, picking her up or coming to see her, mm -hmm. I'm like, little brother, hey, how you doing? And mm -hmm. next thing you know, I'm getting to take trips to the neighborhoods and I'm getting to hang out on the corners. And when you don't have, not to say that it was the, oh, you had to, but. You didn't have another role model. I didn't have no father in the house. I didn't have no big brother. You know, nobody was playing sports or net or or positive, you know. Mm -hmm. I saw gangbanging every day, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I walked home from school, gangbangers. My sister getting picked up by gangbangers. My cousins messing with gangbangers. Mm -hmm. We lived in gangbang neighborhoods. So 
I mean, and then I guess, you know, like I said again, my father, before he left, worked at General Motors. My mom's was a nurse. But when they divorced and it was time to, by the time I saw, it was nothing but gang banging. So what mm-hmm. you going to do? You're going to get sweated or jumped every day or you're going to mm-hmm. become a part of something so you feel like you belong. And that's basically what it was. Just mm-hmm. being able to felt like somebody had your back and you belonged. And you wanted to protect where you was from, your neighborhood. And because you were in this gang banging lifestyle, how do you feel when you hear people overstating their gang ties or like representing for something they know nothing about? I mean, it, it's different now. You know, to, to me now, it's commercialized and glorified to a certain aspect because, you know, back in my days, you couldn't even step in buildings being a gang banger. You know, record company was scared of us, mm-hmm. you know. I couldn't go certain places. I couldn't do promo tours. I couldn't do in stores because they were literally scared. Now it's like, a, uh, I don't want to say a fad because it's some dudes who are still out there. I know dudes mm-hmm. just coming home from prison, still living the life. But it's not as, it's not to, like I say again, I don't want to knock nobody for the new generation that feels whatever. But to me, it's not as it's, if it, it's, that it was. It mm-hmm. wasn't. It's not. It, it's far from it. Because me as a youth, I was scared to stand on a bus stop every day to go to school. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, everybody, not to say friendly with it, but we have calmed down greatly. You know, Bloods and Crips work together, get mm-hmm. money together. That's the, that's the stigma now. Mm-hmm. Let's get money. Let's get money. Let's yeah. get money. Now on the bus, the homeless people are more scary than the gangbangers because that's who I almost got attacked by. I mean, that too. I mean, be like, we have learned to work together to see a greater good. I guess with everything else that has came along, I mean, like I said, this was back in the 70s, you mm-hmm. know, for me. So to come this far and it be 2020, it's not as, as to my standard, when I was gangbanging, it's not as vicious and it's a, a lot of more unified or trying to come along or make money. But not to say that brother still ain't out there killing you know what I'm saying? Because it's still going along. It's just how do you look at it nowadays, I guess. Me being older and being able to accept things differently than I when I was at 17. You mm-hmm. hear me? So that's what it is. Um, they say you can never leave a gang, but they also say that gangsters get fat and move to Miami. <laughs> True. Um, how does a gangster reconcile a pass as they grow into a functional member of what whatever non-gangster society is? <sighs> For myself, mm-hmm. I just became of age. Mm-hmm. And I just started thinking more of a positive black man instead of a gangbanger who was trying to, you know, mm-hmm. with kids now and not living in the neighborhood and being able to see other sides of life. Uh, you have to be able to be open-minded. That's just like, you know, a person who may grow up in a racist household. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're taught that from birth, mm-hmm. you know. So as they get older, they might go, oh, shit, never had a problem with a black guy or right. a white guy or whatever. Same as me, you know. Uh, you know, I had beefs with DJ Quick, mm-hmm. who was a blood or whatever, and I used to work around in my early Compton's Most Wanted days and still try to affiliate myself with it because that's what I thought made it important. Mm -hmm. You know, people saw that I was from a gang and I represented and regardless of everything else, I was still being true. Mm -hmm. But then when you grow up and you got a 15-year-old son in the house, I don't want that shit for him. Mm -hmm. You get me? So you have to be open-minded more nowadays and be like, like I said, I just took on the role of just trying to become a positive black man Mm -hmm. and see that there's more to life than just hating on a dude because of a color. And like I said, different situations when you're youth, you don't know too much. You know, you follow in the footsteps of whatever is put before you as a young kid, but then you come of age, Mm -hmm. you know, at a certain part in your life and you just have to start thinking as a grown up and for yourself and what's more important. That's right. Um, one of the greatest moments I think in hip hop is you and Quick reconciling. Right. Um, especially for the West Coast. You know, I don't know if people who are not from the West Coast. Obviously, I'm not from the West Coast, but I don't know if people who are not from the West, not from the West Coast understand how big that was. Um, from my understanding, Snoop and a bunch of other artists got involved. Right. To help bring y'all together. Right. Um, it got deadly serious. You know, someone lost their life. Exactly. Um, over that. But I worked with Quick shortly after uh, 
balancing options. Mm-hmm. And um, quick was, remember I said my records was doing well on the, on the West Coast. Um, uh, K, not K Day, um, The Beat. Right. The Beat had shows with Snoop was on the radio and Quick was on the radio. He was playing The Blast. So The Blast got, that was my introduction to the West Coast. Yeah, we love The Blast. They love The Blast. Yes. Uh, Hot Tech started working with Snoop and Dre because of that record um, after that. And he and worked with The Game and worked with a lot of other artists. Um, I remember having a conversation with Quick and that, I loved that Quick album. I didn't grow up on DJ Quick. I knew Tonight, right. you know what I'm saying? I didn't know Deep Album Cuts. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wasn't, when y'all had y'all beef, I knew about it, but I didn't know, I didn't really know. Right. We didn't, I didn't really know. Um, listening to Balance and Options, that was the first quick album that I was like, oh shit, like that, I really related to that album. He's talking about peace on that album. Right. He's talking about squashing the issues with MC8 on that album. Um, but when I was working with him, I remember him being disappointed with the reception of the album. Right. And saying, even though it was his best intentions, he put his best foot forward. He said he knew the music was banging. I got, you know, James DeBarge on the album and Mossberg was killing it. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was disappointed in the fact that the fans didn't want to hear him talking about peace. Mm. Um, is that something that gangster rappers think about often? I do. Okay. I mean, I think about trying to please fans mm-hmm. who got me to a certain point. Right. Those fans still want you. Like, I get comments today. Mm-hmm. Man, uh, do some of that shit from when? 1992. I like your, I'm old, like, your old hip-hop voice. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, dude, it's 2020. Right. Like, you want me to rap about drive-by killings and jumping in a six tray with my pistol and right. hitting corners? Right. I'm like, dude, I'm beyond that. Mm-hmm. So we, we try to please fans. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of us do as artists, Mm -hmm. but it comes a time when you as an artist and a mature artist and, you know, you feel like, let me try to transition into some different music that's not about I'm going to ride on eight or Mm. me and the homies rolling around with 40 ounces and, Mm -hmm. you know, you try to get out that. So, and then especially if you have children, Mm -hmm. you want to, like I said, but my son, you know, he listened to all that crazy shit right now, (laughs) but you try to instill in them with your fans. Like, you know, we are no longer in that state of mind. Right. I am no longer thinking like I did when I was 18 years old, Mm -hmm. still hanging on the block, Mm -hmm. making rap records. Mm -hmm. Now I'm about peace. I'm about trying to stack money, Mm -hmm. invest, and still have a good time. So let me try to figure that out a way for my fans to enjoy. But for people like Quick and myself and, you know, in that arena where Mm -hmm. we came from, Mm It, it's like a it, it's it's like a tightrope you're walking, right? Because like I said, I still have fans who bought music to drive by, and it's a Compton thing. I still got fans who saw Menace to Society, mm-hmm. you know. So those are the ones who feel like, and especially when you hear the music of today, mm-hmm. they want to keep the authenticity mm-hmm. of what you were brought up with or what I used to listen to when I was in high school or when we was hanging on the block or like I get a lot of comments and dudes tell me, man, you got me through prison. Right. You got me through this or that because I rapped about those pitfalls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going to prison, being shot at, going to jail, selling drugs, having problems at the home with a single mom and no father and I wrote about that as a youth because that's what I went through. Right, right. I'm not going through that anymore. You get me? So now let me try to educate you in a different light. So it, it like I said, it's it's a it's a give and take. Right. We want to remain true, but then we want to be able to show our our adversity with the new rap game and hip hop and being able to transition from being these 17, 18 year old dudes who looked like there was no tomorrow. And then now we're here in tomorrow. So we got to do something different. Right. Um, Your name was inspired by KRS-One? Yes. How so? Um, Everybody was... Rap master this mm-hmm. or MC fresh this and mm-hmm. that and 
I love KRS One. Yes, uh, me too. Rest in peace to Scholar Rock. I Absolutely. love them too. When yeah. they first came out, the bridge is over. Poetry, mm-hmm. uh, you South know, South Bronx, the South Bronx. Yeah. I mean, on B Boy Records. Yeah. I mean, I had the twelve inch. Yeah. I loved Criminal Minded. Yeah. So I wanted to. He was That's hard. That's gangster rap shit. He was hard yeah. to me. Like I don't Easy E and mm-hmm. you know you get the Rick Ross and Jay and all that mm-hmm. shit. KRS One yeah. was yeah. hard. Yeah. So I wanted to be KRS One. So I came up with MC Eight. One of my favorite moments in my hip hop career is when Brady gave me a number. I text you and I'm like, yo, you think you can make it at 2.30? And you text me, Gia. All day. <laughs> G-E-A-H. When did you start saying that? I started saying Gia back in 88 mm-hmm. when I was making demo tapes, mm-hmm. you know, in my homeboy's garage. And I just wanted something different. Mm-hmm. I just wanted something to, to you know. It's like, yeah, but for G's. There you go. <laughs> I just want to clarify myself as being somebody different. Now, people might not know that. And I don't even claim it. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I came up with that. Or when people use it, I just feel honored. Right. That's mm-hmm. something that I came up with has has lasted and has affected other guys. And some people will give me credit for it, you know, and then some people won't. But I don't care. I'm not right. tripping. No it's, it's my contribution to hip hop like like AWAX and Minister Society. You get me? Cheer. I do. <laughs> um, growing up in the hood was what put you on my radar. Yes. I recall watching video music box with Ralph McDaniels. And again, like Compton seemed like a whole nother planet to us. Yeah, we you know, thought we were. Yeah. Yeah. It was just completely different. But that beat with that sample, boom, with the bass line, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, I just something about that. And then that pause style, yes. something about what you was doing on that record. Can you break down the making of that record? Uh, the sample, Cornbread, Earl and Me. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up on that movie. That's probably what, what drove me to that mm, song, yeah. too. I wasn't, uh, I was a 70s flick kid. Mm -hmm. I love 70s flick movies like that. You know, Three the Hard Way. Was Lawrence Fishburne in Cornbread? I think he was. I think he was was like 12 in that movie. Uh Oh, wow. Who knew he was 12? So uh, those movies, uh, the the Sonny Carson movie. Uh, The Education of Sonny Carson. That took place at Fort Greene Park. I was going to Brooklyn Brooklyn Tech across the street. That park where they had that fight. Exactly. My school was across the street from that shit. I grew up on those type of movies, mm-hmm. you know, so... That was a hard one to find, too, because that didn't yeah, have major no, release. No, And I sold copies of that at Akira Books okay. back in the day. Yeah, that, that's the movie. Yeah, and um, Lauryn Hill named her album after that movie. Mm. Gro- basically, growing up in the hood came about because... Uh, shout out to, to Rest in Peace John Singleton. Yes, um, yes. My boy Cube. I, me and JD from the Lynch Mob mm-hmm. used to hang, like, real tough. That mm-hmm. was my boy. So one day we ended up at the movie set and, you know, I had a uh, one time gal for them up, which yeah. was my first single. Yeah. Video was all over the jukebox, whatever. Yeah. So John recognized me and I was kind of shocked because, like I said, I'm still on the block every day. So he recognized me and right then and there, you know, oh, I'm going to get you. I'm, I'm, I need you to do a song for my movie, man. Mm-hmm. That grown, You know, so I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. And like two weeks later, they called my manager and they showed me the movie. Mm -hmm. And from there, I just, I basically just started taking pieces of my own life, you Mm -hmm. know, growing up, single mom, you know, going to visit pops on the weekends, you know, different, different kids in different neighborhoods Mm -hmm. and then watching the movie. So it was kind of easy to me to write, you know, because I tried to write off experience or experience from the homie I knew mm-hmm. or something that I knew that was real life scenario. Yeah. And with that movie being, you know, about what was going on in our neighborhoods, it was pretty easy for me to write. Like, yeah. it wasn't a challenge like, oh, man, what am I going to do and whatever. I just start thinking a part of my own life and half of the dudes I hung with and went to mm-hmm. school with and dudes we gang banged against and I started thinking about, you know, well, they like this down in Texas and mm-hmm. they like this in New York and they like this over here and here. So it was it was simple. You know, yeah. growing up in the hood is what you went through, That's right. especially if you were a black youth and you lived in one of them neighborhoods. You yeah. grew up in the hood. Um, John Singleton's name comes up a lot. Just about every episode of this show. Right. Regardless of where you come from. Exactly. You don't have to just be from L.A. 
somehow we everybody who comes to the show is somehow connected to John Singleton. Mm-hmm. And he's he's been a part of their journey. Yes. Um, what's interesting to me is um, even like with you, you were. Famously, an extra I, snowfall. I was. I'm in the first episode. I'm carrying a baby. I'm a 15 year old mother. Right. And it's crazy because right before he passed, mm-hmm. he had invited me to the set of oh. Snowfall, mm-hmm. and I didn't get to make it. And that kind of that kind of affected me a little because, mm-hmm. like, I was John was one of those dudes who never forgot you. Mm-hmm. Right. You get me. Whether he worked with you 20 years ago mm-hmm. or he worked with you yesterday, like when he saw me, hey, hey, hug mm-hmm. me, hey, man, come to the set and blah. So that was a tragic loss for us because it was. he depicted what we went through as youth. I was watching the season three. I think it's out of Snowfall, mm-hmm. and in season three, there's a character. They they now like Franklin Saint now is the man man. He's like mm. traveling in jets overseas. He's international with it. And he got people on in the in the in the, I guess the projects working right. for him. And um there's a character who's running around with a camera in season three. Okay. He just running around with a camera film filming what's going on in the hood. Mm. And the drug dealer a dude is like Yo, what the fuck you doing with that camera? Like they they chasing him away. And I feel like that character might have been supposed to represent John. Yeah, mm-hmm. I could see that. You know, w- wanting to capture mm-hmm. what was going on in the neighborhood, so people who didn't understand, yeah, mm-hmm. but putting what, himself in danger to do it. Right. I mean, that's no different than a reporter who goes overseas and in the wars and getting shot at and whatever, because mm-hmm. they want you to know the real behind the situation. The story, Your mm-hmm. imagination cannot depict what's really going on. So mm-hmm. we need to show you so people won't be miseducated about what the situation is. And that was probably him. Yeah. You know, people who question why do dudes have to sell dope or gang bang or live here. Or mm-hmm. what? Let me show you why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because there's not too many opportunities, as you can see. So yeah. I could see that. Shout out to my uncle, Stanley Green, who just passed away recently. Um, he's a combat photographer, for one, one of the greatest in the world. OK. You know, when I mentioned his name to other photographers, they're like, that's your uncle. Right. You know, and we didn't know in the family how famous he was in that world until he passed away. Right. We knew he was out there doing his thing. You know, he was out there in Iraq and Russia mm. when the Kremlin fell and everything. But when he passed away, the New York Times and the Washington Post, everybody did all these these tributes to him. That typical stuff, you know. Yeah. When, you, when you're dead, they give you your roses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Most of the people that are selling dope, they don't want to be. They would love to be doing something else. And majority, a lot of them go out of their way to make sure people looking up to them are not trying to follow that I same mean, path. Exact. I didn't, you know, a lot of us didn't want to sell drugs, mm-hmm. you know, but when it's poverty, man, and you want, and you want to eat, and you yeah. want a new pair of shoes, and... That's not even once. That's need. That's need. I, I can't... I, I'm 13 years old. Mm-hmm. I can't go get... Nobody's going to hire me. Right. You get me? And then when moms are struggling, and, you know, she's trying to make a... You know, my mom tried to send us to private school mm-hmm. as a single mother because she didn't want us going to school in this in the system because yeah. she already knew... It's going to be a down. So she struggled every day. And then I was the dude that said, nah, don't do it no more. But then I had to hit the block. Yeah. Not because I had an opportunity or I felt like, oh, I could become a lawyer or I could become a... The opportunities don't present themselves. Mm -hmm. It's just it. Yeah. John created that opportunity for himself. He became what most deaf referred to in the Black Star album as a real life documentarian. There you go. Um... You did the same thing with your music. It's no coincidence. There's, I don't believe in coincidences. You know, everything happens for a reason. Everything. It's no co- coincidence that you came upon John on, and wrote a song that was so visual. You know, because he asked you to write a song about the movie. We had Ice Cube here this morning, right? Talking about Boys in the Hood and all that, and talking about you know how John inspired him to write. Exactly. You know, and um, when you got cast in Menace to Society, uh, you wrote the song for Menace to Society. Yes. Which is a, it's almost like a part two. Yeah. To, to, to growing up in the hood, like the wake your punk ass up, that shit just keeps coming back. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Even in the new era with Kendrick, like talk to me about why that intro of wake your punk ass up and setting up the story and 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 how how you set up how men- menace ends and it fades to black and you hear your voice. I'm about to narrate for you what just happened. Okay. And then 
then that's so ubiquitous and so much part of the culture. Years later, you're narrating Kendrick's song in the same way. I felt like people weren't understanding or wasn't getting why we as young black men Mm -hmm. were in the predicaments we were in. Mm -hmm. So when I came up with growing up in the hood or straight up menace or even with Kendrick, I felt like with Kendrick, he still wanted to remind people that y'all need to stay woke. Mm -hmm. Okay. As far as menace, Mm. I wanted to wake your punk ass up. I wanted to continue what I started as far as with growing up in the hood, because basically the movies basically were like a play off of each other. Mm -hmm. You get me growing up in the hood. You had one kid who dealt with a situation as you did in menace, Mm -hmm. you know, you had Cuba and growing up in the hood who tried to depict what side he wanted to go after his friend got killed. Same thing with, with Kane and menace. Mm -hmm. You know, you got a dude who's supposed to be living this straight path with his grandparents. But then look where you're living at. You're living Mm -hmm. in the projects and all of your friends are gang members or whatever. So it's a tug of war inside you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people not understanding the choices that you make. So, again, Mm -hmm. we're not woke yet because we still haven't people still haven't got why these things are happening. Right. So that line was created basically to try to wake up people who didn't know what we were going through mm-hmm. and, and try to inform them and give them a graphic setting of, you know, just like when the video came on, it was the stop sign and then bingo, mm-hmm. wake your punk ass up. You mm-hmm. get me? Yeah. We're just trying to alert people on, on the conscience side. Yeah, man. Um, the music of that, can you walk us through the production of that track? Because the shit is so lush and it's so original sounding, it's so crisp, and that like even Bruno Mars had to make the shit over. Um, creating Straight Up Menace, once again, well, being in the movie, mm-hmm. I had firsthand of the script or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then a lot of a lot of that stuff I was able to ad lib. Mm -hmm. You know, because of my affiliation with the streets and whatever. So when it was time to create the song and Alan and Albert came to me, they Mm -hmm. just said, do what you do. So being in the movie, having the script. And then, like I said, I was still in the neighborhood Mm -hmm. during that time. You know, seeing a couple of brothers killed, going to a couple of funerals, you know, watching homes tore apart with divorces and moms and dads and separations and all that. I mean, I basically wanted to come up with a song that was more to the point of the struggles Mm -hmm. and and the broken families Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and just trying to show people that everything that they saw as a glamour to us, even though we was rappers and whatever, a lot of these youths had to go through a lot of bad situations. So I always wanted to tell the stories of of my songs, especially with the Menace soundtrack. I just wanted to tell the people the story of hardships. Yeah. You know? Um, I was in high school when Menace came out. I had met a girl on the bus. Oh. I bagged her up. (laughs) Bagged her her up. um, (laughs) Got that number. And I was going to take her to take her on a date to the movies. Um, I don't, you can tell me if my memory is correct because sometimes it's shit from that long ago, your memory changes exactly. change it on you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's not how it was. This is what I remember. I remember at least I was going to high school in Connecticut. The promotion for Menace to Society, the poster, didn't tell you anything about what the movie was about. No. Is, is that accurate? You you saw Menace to Society, and that was it. That was it. That was it. I walked into this movie, and this is like a real visceral experience. I walked into this, already being an MC8, Compton's Most Wanted fan. Right. Two shorts in the movie, right? Right. Already being a short dog fan. You know, Lorenz Tate was new. Mm-hmm. Tyron was new. These yeah. actors. I didn't know the actors. Um, but I was a fan of the musicians. I walked into this movie cold, not knowing what I was about to see. Now, my opinion of Menace is that it's one of the greatest cinematic achievements of all time. Right. I feel like the story, way it tells the story, Hughes Brothers achieved something magical with this movie. I don't know what what they was on at that time. Exactly. But they figured something, they tapped into something. Um, I showed my mother this movie. My mother doesn't watch violent hood movies. Right. I, made, I sat her down. You have to watch, as, as a black woman, 
This is the one you have to watch. You have to get over the cursing. Okay. And get over the, you know what I'm get saying? Get over the other stuff yeah, and just, just watch, watch the movie. Yeah. Yes. But I, I digress from the story. I walked in not knowing what I'm going to see. And so imagine walking in not knowing at all. Exactly. And then you see the Korean store scene. Mm. And I had never seen something that real on the screen before in my life. Um, how did you get cast in that movie? I think we had just released Music to Drive By. Mm -hmm. I Which on. is, I have to say, one of the greatest rap album titles of all time. Mm -hmm. It's a very creative yeah. album right. title. Music to Drive By, I was on tour. And I got a call from my manager and said that these young guys out of film school were looking to do a movie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time I was like, whatever, I'm not no actor. You know, maybe they just want some rapper appeal because mm -hmm. Cube was in Boys in the Hood, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, whatever. So when I go to get back to L.A. to go read for it, um, they told me Ren had went in to read for the mm -hmm. part. Shout out to MC Ren. Shout out to my boy MC Ren. So from there, I was like, oh, hell no. Nah. <laughs> no way they gonna give it to me. I'm right. an unknown, you know, whatever. So they called me back a week later and said that Ren couldn't do it. So they wanted me to come back in for a reading. And I was like, yeah, okay. So I went back in. Uh, I think we went back out on tour. And during the middle of the tour, my manager called me and said, you got to part. Mm. So I had to fly back to L.A. and start reading. Mm. And I didn't think nothing of it at first, you know, because I never considered myself an actor or nothing like that. Mm -hmm. Again, I was still in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So all I thought about was, hey, I, I accomplished my dream. I'm right. riding in a limo. Right. I got on stage. Wow, yeah. Now I'm going back to the neighborhood to hang with the homies. Right. And that's what I did. From there, you know, I, I started going to the readings and, you know, uh, Jada Pinkett was there mm -hmm. and Lorenz and then Pac was there, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I started taking it upon it as maybe, you know, this is something that might be something large. But mm -hmm. to think that it would got to where it is today, mm -hmm. I never thought that. Like, it's another movie. It's a black mm -hmm. movie. You know, it's gang banging. People's not going to understand it, whatever. But I think they did a real good job. And for the fact that when it came to my character, they let me ad lib a lot of shit. Yeah. Go, yeah. Talk to me about that with the ad lib stuff, because I found that to be very interesting that even though like this movie is so authentic, it right. feels so authentic. And I've heard you speak on how the, per what, the writer didn't have some of those. I mean, Phrases. it was a writer. I yeah. mean, you know, he didn't grow up in Compton. Mm -hmm. It wasn't gang banging. So snaps or, on the petrol, all that is all that's you. That's all my shit. Okay. Like, <laughs> that, the, basically, I would read the script and I would come to certain parts and I would say, we don't talk like that. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't say shit like that. We might say this or we mm -hmm. might say that. So they would go, okay, ad lib, say what you say. So that's what I did a lot through the movie. A lot of my lines were ad lib because they wanted authentic, they wanted authenticity from mm -hmm. someone who I was supposed to be portraying, mm -hmm. which to me, like, I do this shit every day. You get me? I sit up with the homies. We smoke. We ride around. We might get into some shit, mm -hmm. but this is nothing different than what I do on a daily basis. So, and they knew that. You know, I, I used to show up to the movie set with neighborhood niggas, mm -hmm. you know. And when we were filming in Grape Street in the projects, I knew the niggas, you mm -hmm. know. I'm over there hanging. So, it was something they saw. So, they like, yeah, eight, we know, even when it came to my wardrobe. Mm. I'm like, niggas ain't wearing yellow plaid. In front. <laughs> Isn't this supposed to be a Pendleton? No, we don't wear yellow. So they would let me, okay, I would wear clothes from home. Right. Wow. You know, it, it was simple. They gave me the freedom to do that because I guess they trusted my instinct of, this motherfucker from the streets. Yeah. So you were more so playing yourself or just like, people around the neighborhood. I'm, that you I'm saw. like I'm playing myself, but then like, you know, this is this is nothing normal than what I've been through mm -hmm. or what the homies have been through or my OG homie has been through. So it wasn't about acting. Mm -hmm. It was just to me about, oh fuck what? Cameras there, don't look at it. Okay, mm -hmm. bingo. Right. So that was it. Um we had Don Cheeto on the show and he played Rocket in in Colors. Yes. And he talked about being a, you know, classically trained actor. And going to the hood to film scenes, you know, and he said, what, what did he say on the show? He said, I was, I he was, was scared. Steeped. He said, I was steeped in Krypton 
and bloodation. That's what he said. <laughs> and he talks about being scared, you oh, know? He, 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 back he, then? Yeah. Shit. He talks about having to act alongside real gangsters. And you talk about how you have to, when you were filming on Grape Street, you got to pay tribute. You got to put people in the, in the film. You know what I'm saying? You gotta stay on code. You have to. Right? I, I do agree with that to some point, but like when I did Snowfall or whatever, they had regular people from the streets and they tried to rob me. So then, like, <laughs> when sorry. you get, it's not funny. I I'm got sorry. my money back because I'm from the streets. That's too. why I'm right. laughing because I, I, knew, I knew you got your, 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 your stuff back. But it's like that, it's like a gift and a curse because it's like, do we we really want people that are not I, trained I, and, and not know how to act? And that's my same shit. I would say that same shit. Do we want real motherfuckers here? Because you never know what's gonna happen with these real motherfuckers at the end of the day. Your fucking camera might come up missing. Yeah. You get me? Real talk. You'll be you'll be having mm -hmm. a motherfucker as an extra right here, and next thing you know, he will swipe your camera and be gone in two seconds. It's a gift and a curse. <sighs> yep. That's it. Because you want the homie who's still there mm -hmm. to have the same, like, dude, we I on mean, some real shit right now. And stuff, don't but... trip. Don't steal nothing. Don't mm -hmm. get it. This is what, but... You can't, like I tell dudes sometimes, my mentality, even though I'm reflecting on them, mm -hmm. it's not going to wear off on them. Mm -hmm. I could be peace with you, mm -hmm. but my nigga right here might want to take your fucking head off. Mm -hmm. right. And I can't control him because he's still in this aspect of motherfucker, this is this, and then right. I can't give a damn. And on a macro level. So you got to know who you're dealing with. On a with. macro yeah. level, as, as inconvenient as it may be, you know, and it seems very inconvenient because it could be something as small as you lose your wallet. You get, didn't your lose shit, it. Well, your shit gets stolen and, and returned to you or you could lose your life. Exactly. It could be It could be as small as I went through some inconvenient shit or somebody got killed because the wrong right. nigga was around. Same thing right? with Straight out of Compton. Right? But, exactly. But, I mean, you can't control, like I tell people, you can only control you. But if you're trying to take out of that, like if you're a filmmaker, you're trying to come up on that neighborhood mm -hmm. and for all intents and purposes, like you have to dip. That's the consequence. You want to get props yes. for being a nigga that kept it real with your film? You kept it then real. you had you to went, go yeah. through some real shit. Definitely. If someone had to get punched in the face, somebody had to get robbed, like that's the cost of doing business on that level. That's the gift and the curse of want to keep that authenticity yeah. of going, this film is about South Central Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can't go to Atlanta and, and make it. it look like LA mm -hmm. because motherfuckers are gonna know. Mm -hmm. right. So we're gonna take that chance and take our film crew and our expensive shit and we're gonna go down there and then we're gonna talk to a couple of dudes and maybe go, hey, mm -hmm. we wanna use a couple of y'all, whatever, whatever. But it's still three or four of them in the background <laughs> going, fuck that. Look, right. there's a rapper I know. I'm not gonna say his name. <clears throat> Because I no because dry snitching today. There's no dry snitching today. <laughs> <laughs> he brought a friend of his to my show. Right. right. Oh, I remember this story. <laughs> and he was like, "This is my man from the neighborhood. He never gets out. Right. I want to show him some real shit." Okay. And we backstage was just me, friends and family backstage. I'm about to DJ. It's a DJ event. <laughs> Got my laptop out. Right. I go to go to DJ. My shit is gone. So I'm not thinking it's all friends and family backstage. I'm not thinking of someone backstage. And my niggas from around my way was like, yo, I think his man. And I'm like, no, y'all niggas, no, no. And they was like, and see, I was slipping. The niggas I brought from around, they was just, they was really on point that day. Exactly. You know, and they was like, no. And they, when they broke it down for me, they did the A, one plus one is two. And mm -hmm. I had to think about it. I'm like, he is, is the, he's a suspect. That's the only one who could have did Exactly. It. And so I just rapper, I had, to, I had to go to my friend who's a rapper and, and be like, yo, I think your man took my shit. And he went and had a talk with his man. He came back. He's like, I don't think he took it. I'm like, eh, I think you need to ask today. His man's getting shifty. And then they found, my friends found the shit while we talking. Same. And they fuck, start fucking his man up. And I'm looking at my man who's a rapper and I'm like, I'm like, see? And he's looking at his man like, yo, man, why you took his shit? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I can't, I, that's the only thing I can do. Yeah. yeah. But you know, the shit, the shit, but I say that to say like, to, to your point of like, you be sometimes trying to take somebody mm -hmm. else. Exactly. Like, you and it want to show, I've, I've taken a lot of dudes mm -hmm. that like are pure, like at this time, I'm like MC8. I'm no longer right. the gang banging, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, tour buses and all that. You want to extend 
the hand to dudes that you used to bike ride with or mm -hmm. throw rocks with or went to grade school with. But you're here and they're still there. Can't take everybody. So, you, like I said, you want to remain, you know, true mm -hmm. to the whatever. So people want me, oh, you know, hates this person mm -hmm. now and he's became, you try to extend, but then like you said, you can't, I take motherfuckers next thing you know, hitting up the hotel wall. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I'm like, right, right. I'm like, oh my God. Oh like, my God. really? <laughs> like, this, this is what we come to do? Right, right. Like, how old are we? Right. Man, y'all got the hood all through the hotel. hallway. <laughs> the I'm Marriott. Like, I'm like the Marriott, the right. court, the courtyard Marriott. At that, like, my in. goodness. Like and, and then we're the only ones from Compton, and y'all got Compton <laughs> Crip hit up everywhere, and like. It, 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 and so at that point, you just got to start going, hey, you can't take him no right. more. You can't take him. He drinks too much. Mm -hmm. Got to watch out from him. He might stake some. Next thing, it's just it. You right. try, you extend, but like I said, you can't control everybody. Right. You, you got to give disclaimers, then they got to stay home. Man, come on, sign this waiver, motherfucker. <laughs> say you're not going to hit up nothing. You ain't going to strike up no walls or do anything while you're in the presence of this tour. Gangster waver. Hey, man, come on. That's hilarious. As your daughter said, you can't take all your motherfucking niggas out the motherfucking house. Oh, that's you can't. That's what my, that's what my daughter did too. You can't. No, she said she's trying I to. I know, but I she's trying to. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that Pac was at these table reads. Yes. He was originally cast to be Sharif. Yes. Talk to us about why he's not Sharif. Okay. Uh, it's to my understanding. The Hughes brothers worked all of Pac's earlier shit. Mm -hmm. Videos. Brenda got a baby. Mm -hmm. All that shit. Mm -hmm. So they knew him. Mm -hmm. Knew he was difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. But I think New Line wanted him in the movie. Yeah, he was big. Juice, yeah. Poetic Justice, you know. And y'all have a relationship with him. And shout out a lot of his videos. Right. We want him. Right. So who knows what happened, but okay, we'll get him <laughs> in the movie. But I don't think it was the plan to keep him in mm -hmm. the movie. We all know Pac. Very vocal, very outspoken. He wanted to understand why he was being Sharif. Mm -hmm. Why is eight the banger? <laughs> Lorenz is the banger. <laughs> Kane is the banger. Why I got to be the voice of reason? <laughs> I'm fucking Every two, crew needs I'm a voice of Tupac reason. I'm fucking Tupac, though. Why, right. you know, my characters aren't the voice of reason. Right. You want me to play the voice of reason? Show the people why I'm the voice of reason. Mm -hmm. What, my brother got killed? I killed a nigga, went to prison. Mm -hmm. Show that. They didn't have time for that. Mm -hmm. We just want you to, man, we be at the readings and it's time I read my part and Jada read her part and some time for my nigga Pac to read. <laughs> Pac go. <laughs> Gemini's <sighs> every time every time every time and he would sit there and look look at the script and you think he's finna read and he would, why is my character playing this but every time he did it every time to where they brought in Vontae mm -hmm. I know Vontae I went to school with Vontae he did a fantastic job so you I, think they purposely gave him that part so he wouldn't want to do it I think so. Mm. <laughs> I mean, come on. I don't think they wanted him in the movie to the first play. I mean, come on. If you shot videos for an artist through their whole first, and mm -hmm. you knew, this motherfucker's a headache. <laughs> Real talk. But that fucking check is on the table. Mm -hmm. What you gonna do? Mm -hmm. You want this check? You gonna get him in the movie. Mm -hmm. Or we might can't give you no check. Mm -hmm. I got you. I'm going to get him in the movie. Mm -hmm. Don't trip. Thank He's going to be in the movie. But I'm going to make sure that it's going to be a part that he is not going to enjoy. Mm -hmm. So what do you think he's going to do? It's going to be disruptive or he going to quit. Mm -hmm. That was probably the main goal. And that's what happened. Now, you enjoyed a very good uh, artistic relationship with Pac. You did a lot of shows. Yes. With him. Um, and you know you was around like you know Pac was bubbling it when he first got to LA you, right. was, you was around I was one of the albums that he recognized and he used to mm -hmm. play when he was locked up in Rikers okay word up um, you said on Vlad TV that you felt like 
Pac's lifestyle when he started trying to roll with gangsters, is trying mm -hmm. to roll with gangbangers for real, that he was going backwards. Do you still feel that way? I mean, I would, yeah. Okay. I feel that way about anybody who had what you had on the yeah. table. Coming from, and not, like I said, we are the, we, we the land of gangbanging, mm -hmm. Bloods, Crips, whatever it is. But to come from New York and then, you know, Oakland by way of, you didn't have to inherit that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like I said, a lot of niggas want to belong when they come a part of something else. And I think that once he got with Suge and them and over there, that the situation overwhelmed my nigga to the fact of, you know, niggas over here claiming we mm -hmm. representing it's about mob it's mm -hmm. about the mob you know should got me out of prison maybe right. it felt like some that obligation you know yeah. to represent the neighborhood that these dudes who were watching your back every day mm -hmm. and then a lot of dudes gonna do that some of them who aren't who are a little naive mm -hmm. to the situation of gang banging you get me because I don't know if you were coming from New York or any other part of the country and you came to California, that shit would fascinate you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It would fascinate you like, man, there's a hundred niggas around here and they all wearing red or blue mm -hmm. and they all together in unity and one motherfucker is all of us. And, you know, that would fascinate you to feel yeah. like maybe this is family. So I just felt it was backwards because... You were already here. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to come from here and go through the transitions of becoming. Everybody knew who Tupac was. Mm -hmm. I mean, fucking, you had your Tupacalypse now. Yeah. You had uh, Me Against the World. Give I it. mean, you had the popularity already of establishing yourself as just an artist. Mm -hmm. So coming to L.A., and being around that gang culture and that unity, it was just a tidal wave of something like stepping in some quicksand. Mm. Once he stepped in that motherfucking shit, it was just over with. It was yeah. a downfall. Because now you hanging around motherfuckers who drive by and shoot at niggas and kill and mm -hmm. been to prison. And it's not about, you know, your mama and, and the black mm -hmm. piece and all that. These niggas banging over here. Mm -hmm. We don't like Crips. Crips don't like us. That's what we about. Mm -hmm. Our territories and our neighborhoods. It's not about the empowerment of <coughs> black people. Right. or n It's about us representing bloods and crips in our neighborhoods. That's it. Mm -hmm. So to me, somebody who had already came through all that shit, mm -hmm. that was a backward step. Because mm -hmm. you already went through that struggle with moms and the police mm -hmm. and, you know, all that. You went through that. Yeah. Moms being on drugs yeah. and all that. So why at all of that and you done made it here, would you think that game banging was the answer to the situation? Right. Pac had a lot of passion in his delivery and his writing. Um it's something about just that I'm um, just that West Coast gang shit that's just cinema cinematic. Right. You talk about people being drawn to it, the romanticism of it. Um, it, it's like you manifested a destiny by having this experience, writing songs about it that made people want to cast you in movies. Right. That made you want to write songs about the movies that you cast in. Um, Hood Rat is a song that's like that. Right. Um, I feel like that's a precursor to what Kendrick did with Shireen right. in that situation. Um, Kendrick, on that album, um, Good Kid, Mad City, to me, that's the hip-hop opera. Right. I feel like he won the Pulitzer because of that album. Definitely, definitely. Man, I'm trying to figure out where my question is with this, but I'm just trying, I'm just, I have all, I have all these things that are connecting as you're telling these stories. Mm. Um, just how tragic and beautiful and lush and ugly everything mm. is at the same time. I guess the way I can best put it together, Wyatt Cenac has a joke where he talks about all the movies about historical events. Right. It don't matter where they took place, all the actors got English accents. Mm. <laughs> so when we watch movies a hundred years from now about LA and Compton and South Central and what y'all was doing, it's going to be played by actors with English accents. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just the films, though. It's the video games, too. Right. Um, you're the voice of Ryder. 
Right. In Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. And like Jazz was saying, you have that voice. Yeah, perfect. You know, um, that voice, obviously, your voice was obviously de- developed from these experiences. Right. But what, what was it like being part of such an iconic video game? Oh, man. Shout out to Rockstar Games. Mm-hmm. Um, One of my favorite games. <laughs> Rockstar had had used a couple of my songs in their first Grand Theft Auto. Mm-hmm. And shout out to DJ Pooh. Um, yeah, definitely shout out to DJ Pooh. DJ Pooh basically was in the works on GTA, mm-hmm. Grand Theft Auto, the one I did the voiceover in. And I guess from the songs they had listened to and they heard my voice and they were like, oh man, he'd be perfect because they had, I guess, modeled this character after looking like Easy e mm-hmm. in the game. So they wanted a distinctive voice for the character. Mm-hmm. You know, I had never done any voiceovers or nothing like that. You know, I wasn't in it. Look at me talking about voiceovers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Fancy. So they called me up and said they were doing this video game, and I'm thinking they just wanted to use another one of my songs, but mm-hmm. they wanted me to fly to New York and basically be in the game. And I was like, doing what? Mm-hmm. They were like, we want you to voice the character. So I thought that was a tremendous uh, opportunity, you know, for... Uh, people who hadn't heard of MC8 or heard a song or whatever. It was just another uh, pillar in my career of trying to establish who I was as an artist and just a well-around person. So when they contacted me, I said, yeah, I'll come do it. And I went to New York, you know, hung out with Primo for three days. Shout out to Primo once again. Shout out to Primo. Uh, Hung out with Rockstar and Primo and in the studios. And basically they played the video game for me on the screen and gave me a script wow. mm-hmm. and I sat there and I just basically voiced my character to everything I was seeing him doing on the screen. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of fucking work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did that too for um, Mark Echo getting up uh, video game. I played right. the main character, Train. Um, and it was like a couple of weeks of, yeah. I remember my voice, I lost my voice doing this shit. Yeah, I was there for about uh, maybe five days. Yeah. So it was long, but it was worth it because like I, I you know, I get people now, you know, even beyond music and records and they recognize, oh, my son plays that game or my son, <laughs> oh, we it. were, sit- we, we were people. sitting up last night right. and I didn't even know that was you. And, you know, because I coach football. So a lot of mm-hmm. my kids is like, oh, that's coach right there. That's coach. <laughs> and the parents come to practice the next day and be like, I never knew that was you. Right. He plays that game all day. <laughs> and now oh, that I hear the voice, now I'm that, like, right. that's that's coach. Now you can't yeah. unhear it. Yeah. So, so uh, it was a good opportunity. Yeah. Uh, first off, when it's funny because when my boyfriend moved here, the first first thing he was like, "It's like, oh god, it's Grand Theft Auto." But uh, <laughs> when you do you play the game? When you play the game, uh, like actually, I've never played it. You've never played never. it. Heard your voice? No. Are you a gamer at all? I'm a gamer, but I'm a sports gamer. Mm-hmm. Madden, go- Madden, uh, NBA. I might play a little Call of Duty, but. Mm-hmm. Um, my son is a GTA gamer all day. Man, you gotta you gotta play the game and just go all around shooting people and, and fucking look, prostitutes. I know I'm not the <laughs> I'm not the cleanest cut motherfucker, but that game is vicious. Yeah, it is. That shit is vicious. You the, know from the laundry room, man. The women, <laughs> and the women, and all the man, yeah. they, they be doing some wild shit. Oh, I love it. Man, I man, kids shouldn't be playing that game. They, and should they really not. shouldn't. They should. It's some explicit shit in that game, man. Word up. Um, talk to me about the group Warzone. Warzone. Snoop Dogg, Goldie Lope, Cam, MC8. Right. Um, Warzone happened at the time where uh, Snoop was trying to, you know, establish, you know, a uh, um, Uh, sort of a foundation Mm -hmm. with artists over here. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of artists were clicking up together, you know, trying to build something. So Snoop had an opportunity where he brought us all in, you know, as as individuals to work on different songs or Mm -hmm. whatever. And And Candy's my shit. Right. From there, we built up uh, from me and Goldie and Cam just hanging together a lot at the studio. We came up with the group, The War Zone. Uh, I think Cam came up with the name. Shout out to Cam. And um, That's a great, great artist. Great Cam's great artist. Shout great, out to Cam. Great human being. 
great activist, great yeah, great activist yes. on that. So um, we basically used to go to Snoop's studio and put songs together, you know, me, Cam, and Goldie. And like I said, we got to do uh, two songs on the Blue Carpet Treatment, Don't mm-hmm. Stop and Candy. And uh, Snoop got so busy, you mm-hmm. know, with other situations that the, the project never came to fruition. So we did a whole album and it got shelved. But, mm-hmm. you know, I I didn't look at it as a as a hardship of, oh, I don't fuck that nigga or that type of shit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's it's things you go through. Mm-hmm. I look at it like that. Life, you go through situations. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You got mm-hmm. to move on to the next episode. And that's how I started taking stuff. You know, it's so it's it's too much to have beefs and shit with motherfuckers over, over business and whatever. Mm-hmm. Business is business. Mm-hmm. It didn't work, it didn't work. Right. I ain't got nothing personal against you. Right. I didn't lose nothing, you didn't lose nothing. Let's shake hands and go about our business. And that's the way I try to take situations now. It might work, it might not. You no know, doubt. long as it didn't cause no harm to my family or, you know, you didn't rob or steal from me or nothing like that. If it's business, it's business. We mm-hmm. can't do business, that's that's fine with me. Right. I still shake your hand and we keep it moving. No so doubt. me and Snoop still got a good relationship, as I do with all of them. Cam, Goldie, mm-hmm. you know, it that's the way it is. Grown men gotta be grown men sometimes. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's one of the best learn the best lessons I learned from college was business is never personal. You can't, you know, and I try to do that with a lot of cats I mess with. Because I've known them Mm -hmm. or that foundation is long and I might disagree with members in my group Mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever. But I I try to tell them from the gate, don't take this shit personal. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do because I pull up on you right now and we could smoke and have a drink Mm -hmm. and laugh all day. Mm -hmm. Business is that. Right. You conduct your business a certain way. I have to because of who I am. I, that's just it. Mm-hmm. I'm no longer going to take shortcuts or you're my friend, so I'll take a slack or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's business, dude. Mm-hmm. Let's forget about it. Here, roll something up. Let's move on. Mm-hmm. That's how you have to because that's how things get accomplished and that's how you establish yourself is to me is being an adult. Shit. Can't throw a temper tantrum because shit don't work out. That's right. Business is business. It ain't personal. So let's move. Now, I'm on the new Gangster album. Right. Just- and this is like an honor for me. Um, I'm on a song called Business of Art. Yes, indeed. Rest in peace to Guru. Um, you all have day. on the yeah, hoodie. Yeah, all day. One of the best yet, one Gangsta of the best Hoodie. Yet. Shout out to DJ Premier. That's somebody that you do good business and good art with. Yeah, that's my brother, man. That's that's somebody beyond music, man. I've been knowing Primo since we first got started. And that mm-hmm. was decades ago. And, and when I used to be through my little promo tours or mm-hmm. whatever, fucking with Sony or whatever, mm-hmm. Primo was one of the dudes who always came and fucked with me on just personal. Mm-hmm. Come pick me up in that MPV. Yep. And we ride to his crib and it'd be me and him and Guru, a little young Nas is in mm-hmm. there kicking it. You know, we just at Primo's Brownstone, just hanging, smoking, playing music. Them was good times to me. Yeah. You know, anytime Primo came to the West Coast, him and Guru, we we hooked up. You know, I took him through the neighborhoods. We rode. You, I, I tried to just establish friendships with dudes. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Beyond the, the rap game. And that's where we are to this day. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Primo is one of the dudes that I really consider a friend. And outside of if I never made another record or he never did a beat, mm-hmm. we would still chop it up. Now, he produced on that Keep It Hood. He uh, produced on Keep It Hood. And he, me and him did a project together called Which Way Is West. Which Way Is That's the, your most recent project that yes. just came out. He did like four joints on there? Yes. But he executive produced He executive it. produced the whole record mm-hmm. and he did four cuts on the record. Man. Um, working with Primo was a my one of the, you know you have benchmarks bucket list shit yes, yes. you know that's like a bucket list joint for me and Look, I tell people that all day because people are so you know fascinated oh man you know DJ Premier and man Premier just gave you a shout out and when I said man I've been knowing Primo before, when he was coming from Houston you mm-hmm. get me so I've, I've been knowing him for a long time so a lot of people don't understand that people are, are sometimes true friends in this game right. besides business and that's what I like to establish with dudes you know what I'm saying if we never work or never did a song or a beat or whatever man if I see you mm-hmm. you my dude that's you right. get me um, you also I heard this well I read this when I was look, researching things about your career that you once worked with Old Dirty Bastard yeah ODB yeah. talk to me about that ODB, um, 
man, Wu Tang. Um, when I did music to drive by, mm-hmm. it's a long time ago. Wu Tang called my the Sony offices mm-hmm. and flew me out to Staten Island to be in a "Can It All Be So Simple" video. Mm. So if wow. you watch that video, you'll see me in the car with meth, and then you'll see me hanging in the front of the the whatever that is, the store, the food bodega. Plate. Right, you see me go. hanging <laughs> with Raekwon and them in front of the bodega. Man, I didn't even I put that together. Got to yeah. go back and watch it now. Yeah, go back, go back and, watch, and watch it. You'll see me. Um, they was dudes that. Mm-hmm. I, I knew them. I used to see them when mm-hmm. I used to go to fucking New York. And mm-hmm. from there, I was cool with I was cool with Meth Ray and ODB mm-hmm. real good. When ODB uh was in I don't I want to say Oakland or something. I was on a promo tour. He was at E40 Studio. And we actually did the Shimmy Shimmy Ya remix mm-hmm. together. Me, him, and E40. Okay. And from there, he when he, he would come to LA all the time. We would hang. He he ODB was another one that I respected as far as outside of music because, like I said, he was somebody who reached out to me. They reached out to me, you know, and mm-hmm. I respected that because I felt like dudes were hearing me, mm-hmm. as so to speak, you mm-hmm. know. So I, I certain dudes I had mad respect for, and like on top as far as friends, ODB was one. That's beautiful. Rest in peace to ODB. All day. Um, well, right now there's a kid in Compton living in a destitute situation, no father around, seeing nothing but drug dealing and banging, seeing seeing violence everywhere. The lights of Hollywood is in the distance. You know what I'm saying? Like you, the close proximity to Hollywood, but then it seems a world away. Right. Mm-hmm. You used to be this person. Right. What advice do you have for a kid who feels like it's just hopeless? Mm. Feels like I don't see any opportunities to get out of the situation in Compton that I'm living in right now. And not just a kid in Compton, but like you said, growing up in the hood. Mm-hmm. A kid in that hood situation, regardless of region. What I would tell is like I would used to tell myself is there's nothing wrong with hopes and dreams. Mm. You get me? Did I ever think I was going to make it off of Johnson Street in Compton, California, gang banging and all that shit? No. Mm. But I still hoped and dreamed and I think that gave me the the that gave me the the will to want to pursue a different way out. You know, on nights when niggas was finna go kill people, I said fuck that, I'm going to the studio. Mm-hmm. You have to at some point not give up on yourself. Mm. Um, and you might not have a, you know, you can't look at everybody as the next role model because shit, I'm going through hard shit. Mm -hmm. You have to look towards yourself and your future and believe that you have a future just because you living in Compton and they shooting every day and whatever. If you can get your mind state to know that I can, like I can, I don't have to join a gang. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't have to sell drugs. It might be hard because I ain't got no finances or no whatever, but find somebody that believes in you. Mm-hmm. That's what I say. Because there's going to be somebody. Mm-hmm. But you have to not get discouraged when it don't happen tomorrow. Right. Or you look up a month from now, oh, it ain't happening. Because shit, I used to say that shit every day until one day I walked into a motherfucker's garage and made a demo tape and that demo tape flew from here to here to here to here. I used to hate it. I for gang bang, I no motherfucking money. I want some new Jordans. Mm-hmm. Mama's struggling. She can't give me no money. Do I gotta go sell dope? Do I gotta do this? Do I got? At some point, I said, "Fuck that." I gotta go to the studio. Mm-hmm. There's gonna be somebody. You want to be an artist or whatever, a graphic designer, or whatever. There's gonna be an opportunity. Mm-hmm. You just have to be patient enough to wait for it and know that you don't have to fall into the victims of the wrong path to get there. Mm-hmm. Just got to be straight and narrow. That's all I say. Believe in yourself. Have confidence and like Nipsey say, invest in your fucking self. Mm-hmm. If nobody else believe in you, mm-hmm. you believe in yourself. That'll take you far as fuck. I uh, saw a meme today and it said that you wouldn't plant a seed and expect for the plant or the flower to grow right away. So why are you expecting for things to your situation to change just that fast? You have to give it time. And that just goes exactly and, and, what you and were saying. And let me tell you another thing. 
Who's to say when you plant the shit, it's going to grow the first time? Mm. You might not know how to even plant your shit right now. Mm. But if you keep learning and keep learning from the mistakes, oh, okay, I didn't use enough water last time. Or oh, this time I got to be patient enough mm-hmm. and I fuck with the shit when I put the water on it. Just let it sit there. You have like, once again, you have to have confidence in yourself if you know you have the ability Give yourself time. It'll happen. Mm. You get me? All We all presented with opportunities as greater later, but that's what it is. You have to be patient enough to wait for it to come because mm. sometimes you might be looking at the shit and it's right there in your face and you so fucking agitated that it's not what you want that you like, man, this shit ain't working, but it's right there. Everything got a season. It's definitely. Yeah. Um, AWAX, the character from the movie Menace, he survived the movie, right? Yes. Okay, so I went to acting school, and one of the things that I retained from acting school was a sense memory. Uh, when you have a character, in order to really get into that character, you develop a backstory for that character. Right. You were talking about how Tupac was frustrated because he wanted a backstory for his character to be represented in, in the thing. Now that you you write in a cinematic fashion. Right. Give me, use your imagination, if you will, and I don't know if you formed a backstory for AWAX, right. but tell me what happened to AWAX after. Is AWAX still alive in 2020 and what is he doing? Mm. Hmm. AWAX, if you if you didn't understand, AWAX was one of those guys who was already older from the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So he had already been through a lot of trials and tribulations and seen. AWAX was one of those dudes who felt like he could manipulate the youth mm-hmm. to do what basically he didn't want to get caught up doing. Mm -hmm. So that tells you he had the sense enough to know what was right or wrong from the situation Mm -hmm. that he was presenting himself. Hopefully, my thinking is that after seeing some of the homies die and seeing that you were an older character, that you got out of the situation you were in and tried to do something to help the youth that were still in that situation, that a lot of us do, Mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, older guys who have been through the gangbang and have saw death and losses and, and, and pitfalls, some of us do get out of the transition of wanting to encourage and start being an advocate for those mean streets and try to tell youth that there's a better way. So Mm -hmm. that's what I see for an older dude if I'm taking it from myself Mm -hmm. because from myself is the same shit. Once I got older, I saw that there was more to it than not saying not wanting to represent the neighborhood because I still... I still love where I came from. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't trade it for shit. Mm -hmm. The pitfalls, the ups and downs, the jails, getting shot at, uh, trying to sell drugs or whatever, because it it enabled me to be able to teach my son now of what not to get into. And and it showed me that I could make it the next year. Hmm, Maybe I don't need to do that no more. And now I made it another year. Oh, fuck that shit too. Oh, I made it another year. You know something? Uh, yeah, this is working for me right here. So let me just lace up my tie and put on my jacket and shit and say, fuck the converse and whatever. Not that I'm disrespecting niggas who come through it because yeah. we still got people there. Mm-hmm. And I and not that, oh, I respect the nigga that's gang banging, but I understand the struggle. Yeah. I did it. So I understand where you're coming from. But me... As an older dude with a with a son who's 15 years old, who likes the, you know, the the the, the sexual songs mm-hmm. and the, the 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 twerking girls mm-hmm. and the dudes who talking about they shooting up dudes with Dracos and mm-hmm. all that. Right. I have to show him I did that shit. Yeah. That ain't nothing there for you. Right. So that's why my thing is to stay on him and show him that there's a better way than what's depicted. And what's glorified. And like I say, once again, I will never change where I came from, what I represented, because it enabled me to be the person I am right now. Mm-hmm. Party people. That's legendary. Give it up for the legendary. Yeah. MCA. Yeah. yeah. Woo. Thank you, bro. Good looking, man. All day. 